Headed into presidential election week, we'll take a look at the good, the bad, and the ugly. To view the video in full screen mode, use this icon in the lower right hand corner of your video player. To improve the clarity of the charts, use this icon in the lower right hand corner of your video player. Given the widespread carnage over the past few weeks, there's no sense beating around the bush, so let's kick off the video with the ugly. A wide array of ETFs, their performance in the month of October easily can be classified as ugly. Let's highlight just a few here. Dividend stocks down 3%. International real estate over 6%. Dividend stocks another form 3.5%. Treasury bonds 4.5%. If you bet against the US dollar down 3%. Europe 3.5%. REITs 5.7%. Home builders down almost 7%. Healthcare down over 6.5% in the month of October. Oil and gas stocks down over 8%. Retail, 3%. International treasury bonds over 4%. Oil, 3.38%. Australia, 3%. Switzerland, over 5%. Singapore, 4.7%. UK, 5.3%. South Korea, 47 Natural gas, over 9%. Biotech stocks lost over 11% in the month of October. Small cap value down over 3%. And clean energy stocks, ticker symbol PBW, in the month of October down over 5%. The average loss of the ETFs shown in orange, month of October, over 5%. Has ETF performance improved in early November? The answer is not yet from Twitter. Here's the Twitter handle. This is a weekly Recap, you can see numerous ETFs across a wide array of asset classes had a very painful week. Sticking with the ugly, here's our long-term consolidation box that we've been watching. This is calendar year 2013 here. If we look at the broad MYSE composite, now we're roughly 8% below where we were in July of 2014 and roughly 9% below the peak in the spring of 2015. Sticking with the ugly, last week we talked about this downward sloping trend channel here. This is the weekly version. What once acted as resistance may now act as support. You can see we blew right through that. What once acted as resistance may now act as support. So it's possible that even under bullish conditions, the S&P 500 would drop below 2060 if it held in this area here. Doesn't get much uglier than this. The last nine trading days from a fear or anticipated volatility perspective, the VIX has been green nine days in a row. That has never happened before. It's been 36 years since the S&P 500 dropped for nine consecutive sessions as it has done over the last nine trading days. From a hard data perspective, as we've noted on short takes, we've seen significant deterioration in the hard data tracked by the model from point A to point B here in round figures, 43% of the data tracked by the model has seen deterioration over this period here. How do we handle that going forward? We covered that in a November 2nd short takes post. You can find it by Googling this title here. The concepts from this post still apply. As of the close on Friday, the hard data still aligned with our current mix of cash, hybrids, and stocks. One of the reasons we were able to remain relatively quiet this week in terms of making changes to our allocations is we were fortunate enough to have five of the ETFs held by the model. Five of them were green this week. And given the performance of a wide array of ETFs that we just covered in this tweet here, that's a good sign from a mathematical perspective. It wasn't easy to find five major ETFs that were green over the past five trading sessions. It also tells us 
that are major themes of lower rates over a longer period of time and the possibility of inflation expectations picking up, all of that may still be intact based on the asset class performance this week and the fact that five of our ETFs were able to buck the ugly trend over the past five trading sessions. We've seen the ugly. Now let's tone it down a notch and move to the bad. It's a weekly chart of the S&P 500, November 4th on Friday, as of 2.58 p.m. Eastern. Therefore, about an hour was left in the trading session when this chart was printed. The good news, with about an hour left in the trading session, we were holding above these levels. The bad news is the S&P 500 closed at 2085 and change, or a little bit below these levels. And this chart shows us one example of shorter term and intermediate term support that's been broken. I could show numerous charts. We've taken out these levels here. We've taken out these levels here now. Therefore, as long as we stay below those levels or the longer we stay below them, the more concerning it becomes. It's something that we're respecting and helps us keep that important open mind heading into next week. Here's another example. We've been watching 2099 and 2091. We closed at 2085, again, below these levels here. We can see the same thing on a daily chart. We're below all of these levels that we talked about last week. That's the bad news. The good news is we're still inside this Brexit box here. So it's possible that the market could right itself, but we can't minimize the fact that this possible support has not acted as support. And until something changes, we're respecting this decline here. Before we move on, a fair question from a client might be, if you've seen deterioration in 43% of the data tracked by the model, then why haven't we taken more defensive action? The answer is our overall allocation is still in line with the evidence we have in hand. For example, if you look at your account and you add up our cash, our bonds, and our physical gold, all of those positions can be classified as relatively conservative. So when we look at the entire portfolio and we look at the facts that we have in hand, right now we're allocated almost perfectly. The probability of that lasting is relatively low. Why? The market's either going to fall further and then we will have to take additional defensive action or there's a possibility that we could see a sharp rally. Under those conditions, we might be forced by the data to redeploy some of our cash relatively quickly. How we do that is outlined in the short takes post from this week. Is there any basis for optimism going forward, looking out several weeks or several months? We'll answer that question in the good segment. Are there things to be concerned about heading into election week? The answer is yes. We just discussed the deterioration in the data tracked by the model, and that has reached concerning levels, and it's something that we have to keep an eye on. However, not all of the data that we have in hand falls into the concerning category. So let's cover some of the data and some of the observable evidence, some of it tracked by the model, some of it not tracked by the model, that still looks fairly optimistic looking out several weeks, months, or years. This is gold here. This is the 200-week moving average in red here. This is 1997. You can see physical gold dropped below the 200-week moving average in 1997. After that, after we could see it, really bad things happened in physical gold while it stayed below the 200-week moving average. This is calendar year 2001 where my cursor is. Then early in calendar year 2002, physical gold recaptured the 200-week moving average in red. This is a good sign here. What happened next? After the observable evidence improved, really, really good things happened for a very long period of time in physical gold. 
after the observable evidence improved in 2002 and became very favorable early in 2003. From this point here to this point here, physical gold moved from 279 to 1924, which represents a 590% gain over several years. And notice during the entire rally here, physical gold stayed above the 200-week moving average. Remember, in technical analysis, we're looking for things that are different. This, early in 2013, looks different now. Instead of coming back and staying above the 200-week moving average, now we close below it here. And after that, after we can see this, really bad things happened in physical gold for several years years, taking us to the end of 2015. If we fast forward to the present day, does it look more like this period here, or does it look more like this period here? We rallied off of the low in late 2015, and you can see now, especially if we zoom in tighter, physical gold is above the 200-week moving average. This looks similar to this period here. Obviously, it doesn't mean we're going to see a gigantic move like this, but it does tell us that the probability of good things happening is higher today than it was any time during this decline in 2013, 14, and calendar year 2015. Like this move here, it speaks to probabilities now and like this negative move here, the present day also speaks to probabilities. Now we're sticking with the good, or is there any observable evidence that gives us a basis for optimism? Remember our long term for illustrative purposes only 30 week in blue, 40 week in red, and 50 week moving average in green. This is an anecdotal example here from 2009 after the stock market bottomed here we went from a full bore bearish look to a full bore bullish look here in August of calendar year 2009, telling us the probability of good things happening was higher here than it was here. How does the exact same chart look today? Does it look more like this over here or more like this period here? Even after a multiple week decline, we still have the fastest moving average blue on top. Red is in the middle in the present day, and green is on the bottom. This is a favorable look here, and the slopes of all of the moving averages are still positive. Longer term, this is still a much better look than this look here late in calendar year 2016. It doesn't tell us anything about what's going to happen next. It just tells us its present state still calls for some patience in terms of our overall allocation. You can also ask this question. Does the present day here look anything like this concerning period here with the same moving averages in calendar year 2000? And after that, the S&P 500 lost an additional 47%. The answer is no. The present day doesn't look like this here, nor does it look like this concerning period here we're blue, the fastest moving average is on the bottom. And after that, after we can see it here, the S&P 500 lost an additional 52%. This really doesn't look anything like the present day as of Friday, November 4th, 2016. And this looks quite a bit better than this pre-plunge period here where red is on the top, blue is on the bottom, late in calendar year 2015, and after that, bad things happened. One of the great things about a service like StockCharts.com is it enables us to keep chart lists where we can mark up a chart and then we can go back and look at it later, and that's an excellent way to monitor the market's health. But that only works if you look at the charts objectively. Remember a few weeks ago, we looked at the FIB example. This is the S&P 500 off of the 2009 low. We get a bullish move from point A to point B. After that, 
we get a retrace here that lasts several weeks and looks ugly. This is an ugly looking head and shoulders type topping pattern. We break the neckline here. One of the key points is though, this looks like a normal retracement within the context of an ongoing uptrend. How do we know that? A normal retracement would stay typically within these three major fibs. And you can see this multiple week pullback here stayed above all three of the major fibs off of this low, which implies that after you have the normal retracement, that you're going to resume the existing uptrend and you will go on by definition to make a higher high. We covered numerous charts a few weeks ago. So let's look at them today and see if they look concerning today after a multiple week decline. It's global stocks, ACWI, Friday, November 4th. You can see we're still within the green fibs here. This looks like a normal retracement after a move from A to B. And in terms of this move, a bullish move from A to B here, we're well above all three of the major fibs when we look at the February low earlier in calendar year 2016. We also still have an upward sloping 200 day moving average telling us that the longer term trend from a probability perspective remains up. Does the present day here look anything like this bullish bottoming process in 2009? The answer is yes. Price recaptures a downward sloping 200 day moving average. Price recaptures a downward 200 day moving average here, downward sloping average where my cursor is. Then there's some form of a retest while the 200 day is trying to flatten out. Then there's some form of a retest while the 200 day is trying to flatten out. And then the uptrend eventually resumes after a multiple week pullback. Right now, this doesn't look materially different from this period here. Similar situation with silver SLV. We had a pullback to an upward sloping 200 day moving average. We came back to the 50% retracement here where my cursor is. And right now on Friday, November 4th, when this chart was printed, we were above all three of the major fibs. No major alarm bells here yet. It doesn't tell us what's going to happen next, but based on the evidence we have in hand, this still looks like a normal retracement within the context of an ongoing uptrend, implying that SLV, as long as we still have this look, would eventually make a higher high above point B here. And we can see the present day slope here it looks a lot better than the slope during this period in 2013, 14, and 15, when SLV was in the context of a downward sloping and bearish long-term trend. Similar situation with the Dow, we're back into the green fibs. This would be the green A here and well above all three of the major blue fibs based on this low here. Does our present day 200 day moving average look more like this bullish turn in 2009? or more like this bearish turn in 2007? The answer is easy. It still looks more like the bullish turn in 2009 with price above a troughing and now upward sloping 200 day moving average. Everything that we just said about the chart of the Dow applies to SPY. Here's our A, here's our A, here's the B for both of the A's. We're in the green fibs. Looks like we came back to the 50% retracement on Friday, we're still in this area, and we're still well above all three of the major fibs based on point A, telling us a normal retracement from point A to point B could still see relatively significant declines from this level here, and we would still be within the context of the three major fibs can also see that the present day really doesn't look anything like this higher risk period here where the slope of the 200 day moving average for the S&P 500 rolled over early in calendar year 2008. You can also see that it looks a lot more 
like the bottoming process and favorable period in 2009. We retake a downward sloping 200-day moving average. We retake a downward sloping 200-day moving average. We have a multiple week pullback as the 200-day moving average is trying to turn back up. We have a multiple week pullback as the 200 day is trying to turn back up. After that, we see we get multiple, multiple week pullbacks within the context of an ongoing and rising trend. We want to look at the big picture here. So let's look at an equal weight S&P 500. All of the things that we've said about the previous charts still applies to RSP on Friday, November 4th and price relative to the present day upward sloping 200-day moving average really doesn't look anything like RSP's 200-day moving average late in 2007 and early in 2008. And after that, bad things happened. One of our themes is that interest rates will remain lower for a longer period of time. That doesn't mean the Fed won't raise rates in December. We're talking about the long-term outlook for interest rates, IEF. Here's our A, here's our B. Here's an A here where my cursor is. Here's a B. We're above both the green and the blue fibs. Price came back and tagged an upward sloping 200-day moving average. Right now, this looks like a pullback within the context of an ongoing uptrend. Obviously, that's subject to change, but it hasn't changed yet as of November 4th. Similar situation, November 4th. Now we're just looking at a broad VTI or total U.S. stock market ETF. Price remains above an upward sloping 200-day moving average. We're in the normal retracements for the Brexit rally here, A to B, and we're well above all of the three major FIBs based on the February low earlier in 2016. Remember, we said charts are only useful if we look at them objectively. If we were taking a test and the question said, does the present day chart here look more like this concerning period in late 2007, or does it look more like this improving period from a probability perspective in early 2009? The answer is easy. We have a trough here in the 200-day moving average and it's turning back up. We have a trough in the 200-day moving average and it's turning back up. Obviously, all of this is subject to change and it could morph into a look like this, but the key for us is we need to see that and that hasn't happened yet. It may happen, but it hasn't happened yet. We covered this chart of the transportation index last week. On Friday, November 4th, we're still holding above the blue line. Remember a few weeks back, we talked about the Fed raising interest rates and we showed the 100-day moving average in blue, the 150-day in green, and the 200-day in red, and we compared October of last year prior to the December rate hike in 2015 to October of this year, and we said on October 21st that the present day looked a lot better than October 21st of last year. How does the exact same chart with the exact same moving averages look today? Does it look more like this concerning period here, or does it look similar to what we talked about a few weeks ago? The 100-day in pink still has an upward slope, a bullish look to it. 150-day here still has a positive slope, and the 200-day in orange still has a positive slope. All of this is subject to change, but it hasn't changed yet. Last week, we talked about shorting the NASDAQ 100, and we said this, if we were using an inverse fund, was a bearish look for stocks. This was a bearish look for stocks. This is a favorable look for being long the stock market. How does the exact same chart look today? Here's the slope of the same right X inverse NASDAQ 100 mutual fund as of the close on Thursday, November 3rd. And we can see the 200-day moving average here it looks more like the bullish period in 2003 and the bullish period in 2009 
than the bearish period here in 2000 or the bearish period here in calendar year 2008. Emerging markets has not been immune to the ugly look over the past few weeks. However, we're still holding above these blue lines that we talked about in last week's video. We'll learn something either way. Last week, we talked about rising inflation expectations. If precious metals were going up this week purely out of fear, based on fear of the election, we wouldn't expect silver, SLV, to be outperforming GLD. We would expect just the opposite. We would expect fear-based gold to be outperforming economically-based SLV. That's not what we had. On Friday, November 4th, the weekly chart said that SLV was outperforming GLD by over 1% on Friday, November 4th, over the past five trading sessions. And it looks like we could be in retest mode here of this bullish breakout that we covered last week. We'll learn something either way. High beta stocks, November 4th, we're still holding above several levels here. As long as this chart can stay above these blue lines, it still has a relatively favorable look. If you want to look at this from a glass half empty perspective, this could be a left shoulder, this could be a head, and this could be a right shoulder. However, I remember a few weeks ago and even earlier in this video, we covered a similar bearish topping pattern look here. And in this case, we even broke the neckline. Therefore, that pattern is concerning, but it's just one piece of evidence that we'll take within the context of the weight of the evidence. Remember last week, we looked at this chart and said, is there any basis for hope relative to TLT bouncing? We did get a bounce near this trend line. TLT was green this week. And this also aligns with the theory of lower interest rates for a longer period of time. That's the instance where bonds and precious metals can both rise in unison. It's exactly what happened this week. GLD was green and TLT was green. Remember a few weeks back, we talked about consolidation and then trying to capture gains over a long period of time after you get a bullish long-term signal. This looks easy, but if we zoom into the weekly chart and then shift over to a daily chart, remember we said if you bought the breakout here, you would have been disappointed six weeks later, three months later, five months later, even 10 months later, because over that period, there were pullbacks of 3%, 6%, 4%, almost 7%. But that occurred within the context of a 14% gain from point A to point B. When we look backwards, it's easy to understand that markets pull back within the context of a rising trend. Remember, we took these percentages and we applied them to the present day on September 14th. So we said if the S&P 500 in the present day pulled back in a similar manner to these retracements here within the context of an uptrend, then the present day S&P 500 could drop to any one of these thin lines on the chart. We said that several weeks ago. So where do we stand now? These are the exact same lines that we showed several weeks ago when we said a normal pullback might fall into any one of these areas here. This is the same chart, same levels as of Friday, November 4th. And you can see we're right in the meat of what could be a typical pullback from that anecdotal example. We also know our fibs, the Brexit low, point A and point B up here. Here are three major fibs. The 61.8% retracement is down at 2069. So even under this, a here, we could still fall back to 2069. We also have the A to B fibs that we've shown on other charts based on the February low that come in at even lower levels. But right now, this looks like a relatively 
normal pullback within the context of a rising trend. And that is obviously subject to change. We still have some relevant guideposts on our DeMarc charts. DeMarc charts and indicators are proprietary tools from Market Studies LLC. This is a daily DeMarc chart here. This is the propulsion. These are the magnets here. Our daily magnet on the downside is 2058. Think of this as possible support here at 2058 on the daily chart of the S&P 500. Our magnet on the upside currently sits at 2275, telling us based on propulsion, DeMarc propulsion, the risk reward right now is relatively favorable. The monthly chart can also help us keep an open mind about very favorable outcomes and very unfavorable outcomes. And under our system, that's extremely important. The magnet monthly, 2340. The magnet on the low end here, 1793. Two other guideposts, 2075. We closed at 2085 on Friday. Another guidepost at 1966. White space, white space. It calls for maximum flexibility heading into election week. How about from a fundamental perspective? Of course, this is anecdotal evidence from Twitter. Here's the Twitter handle if you want to look at it. This is a neat chart here. It shows retail and food services sales in red here. So this is sales. This is the S&P 500 here. Notice in 2007 and 2008, the red line or sales made a lower high. In the present day, has it made a lower high? No, it just made a new all-time high. This line here speaks to fundamentals relative to deteriorating fundamentals in these industries in calendar year 2008. If you follow Urban, you know he has an outstanding grasp of the fundamentals that impact markets, and he understands how to differentiate the fundamentals that you see in a bull market and the fundamentals that you typically see in a bear market. Urban tweeted on Friday, new high in employment, eight year high in wage growth and consumer debt levels are not that alarming. Put all of that together and he's basically saying calls for an imminent recession do not look credible at this point. Like the charts, is it possible that the fundamental data starts to deteriorate? Yes, it is possible, but like the charts, we don't have that information in hand. We don't have fundamentals that look like the early stages of a new bear market. Remember we covered this, it sounds really concerning. It's been 36 years since the S&P 500 dropped nine sessions in a row. What does history tell us about what happens after the S&P 500 drops for nine sessions in a row? It's a very handy data table from this Twitter handle here if you want to find it. What happens after the S&P 500 falls for nine consecutive sessions? Five days later, you're typically green on average. 10 days later, you're slightly red, but basically break even one month green, three months green, six months, average gain almost 9%. 12 months, the average gain is over 14%. These charts help illustrate the basic concepts used in the model. The model tries to differentiate between lower probability periods and higher probability periods between lower probability periods and higher probability periods here's a timely chart in a market watch article you can google the title here to find it what it shows is the 500 year history of stock performance so some of this is in the united states some of it's outside of the United States. The moral of the story is a lot of bad things have happened 
but the long term trend for stocks has been up. Under our approach, we know this is true. And we also know there are some very, very ugly periods within the context of this chart here. But we also know that the long term trend is up which means all things being equal from a probability perspective, when the odds are in your favor, you're better off acting like a buy and hold investor. When in doubt, when the odds are in your favor, you'd prefer to leave it alone. But there are periods in history, the Great Depression here, when the odds are clearly not in your favor, you can reduce risk. There are numerous ways to try to differentiate between higher probability periods and lower probability periods. Fibonacci retracements are one way. The slope of the 200-day moving average is another way. So in the context of the present day, given the facts that we have in hand, this is the Dow using the Fibs and the 200-day as two anecdotal examples. Given the facts that we have in hand, does it look like we're within the context of a rising trend or does it look like the probabilities are now pointing towards a long-term downtrend? We know the answer to that. We've already covered it. It looks like an uptrend. Therefore, if the present day looks like an uptrend and we know historically stocks tend to go up, then we're better off trying to stay invested when the facts are telling us we can do that. Right now, we've seen some deterioration that is concerning. That's one of the reasons why we have some cash around. Heading into the next week, we have plenty of data in hand that helps us keep an open mind about worse than expected outcomes. We've also covered numerous charts that help us with better than expected outcomes. And we know it's not the mathematical skill that's critical to winning. It's the discipline of being able to stick to the system. How do we track all of this and convert it into a usable and actionable format in a reasonable amount of time? The sub models, we answer binary questions, some of them manually done, some of them programmed in Excel, and we also enter in unbiased and hard data. The submodels allow us to get a handle on the market's current profile, and the master CCM market model then looks at the current profile, compares it to past profiles, and recommends a prudent allocation between risk assets such as stocks and conservative assets such as bonds. Conservative assets can consist of cash, bonds, currencies, or any number of investment options. If you'd like to learn more about the market model or our money management services, you can visit our website, follow along on Twitter, Facebook, read our blog short takes, or watch past videos on the Shivako Capital channel on YouTube. The material in this video has no regard to the specific investment objectives, financial situation, or particular needs of any viewer. This video is presented solely for informational purposes and is not to be construed as a solicitation or offer to buy or sell any security or any related financial instruments, nor should any of the content be taken as investment advice. Any opinions expressed in this video are subject to change without notice, and Shivako Capital Management, LLC, or CCM is not under any obligation to update or keep current the information contained herein. CCM and its respective officers and associates or clients may have an interest in the securities or derivatives of any entities referred to in this material. CCM accepts no liability whatsoever for any loss or damage of any kind arising out of the use of all or any part of this material. We recommend that you consult with a licensed and qualified professional before making any investment decision.